Yo, what's up, y'all? It's the MMA Analyst, here to do my preview for UFC 115. First time in Vancouver, Canada. Seems like it's going to be the last from what, you know, the Vancouver officials are saying. Those guys are just not being, you know, hospitable at all. They are like the UFC's spending tons of money. They might not make anything off this. It costs a whole lot to hold it in Vancouver and all the sanctioning fees and this and that. Man, they don't like money. Those guys seem like they're allergic to cash inflow. But anyways, it is what it is. The Vancouver doesn't want it. You know, Ontario does. Get it done, guys. All right, y'all. 115, Chuck Liddell was supposed to fight Tito Ortiz. Tito Ortiz got hurt. His neck is broke or something like that. So they got to put, you know, what's they, they say? Humpty Dumpty? They got to put Humpty Dumpty together again. That kind of works because he does have a big ass looking egghead. But anyways, now he's fighting Rich Franklin. It is a much better fight. It's more compelling to myself and to most fans that, you know, aren't into seeing somebody fight a dude that he already beat three times. But uh, here we go. Chuck Liddell. A lot of guys are saying, Chuck Liddell, you should have retired. You should have this, should have that. One of those guys is the president of the UFC, Dana White. When I really look at it, though, he lost to the current light heavyweight champion, Mauricio Shogun Hua. He lost to Rashad Evans, the dude that already was the light heavyweight champion and is challenging the current one. He lost to Quentin Rampage Jackson, you know, light heavyweight champion, top 10. And then he also has a loss to Key Jardine, but, uh, you know, whatever. But the point is, out of his last, you know, all of his losses have come to the best guys in the division. He hasn't lost to Machida. If he fought, he would. But, I mean, would people say... You know, you somebody should retire because they can't beat Shogun, Evans, you know, Machida, or Quentin. Yeah, he's not going to get the belt anytime soon, but should he retire because he can't beat the top four guys, top five guys in the division? I don't know. I don't know. And I've never been a big Chuck Liddell fan. I say let the man do what the man does, and that's fight. In this fight, he's going to be coming off a bad streak, two down. He won of a fight over Vanderlei Silva, and then before that, two down. He'll also be coming off a little bit of a time off. He hasn't fought since April 2009, so that'll be a year off. Um, and we, we know all about Chuck. Chuck Liddell's got power in both hands. He's a counterpuncher. He likes guys coming forward, and then he catches them on the way in, finishes them on the way down, and then runs around with his hands, you know, you know, like he trying to break through the finish line or something. Um, That's what Chuck's done. That's what he's always done. He's got that, you know, fastball overhand right pitch that he does. Um, Y'all know Chuck, man, fighting forever. What? He's been fighting. Even though he, he, he has about 28 fights. He's been fighting since 1998, you know. Um, He's going to be taking on Rich Franklin. Rich Franklin's going to be coming in off of a loss to Vitor Belfort. Just a situation where Vitor Belfort is a much better, faster fighter and caught him nice and early. If they fought five times at this point in their careers, it probably would look the same every single time. Before that, he had a, a you know a big win over Vanderlei Silva. And then before that, he had a, a close, close fight and a loss to Dan Henderson. Uh, But pretty much Rich Franklin's been, you know, looking for a home. He's been stranded ever since the spider showed up. Uh, Rich Franklin's fought at 205. He's fought everywhere in between. He fought at, you know, 195 catch weight or something crazy like that. And uh, now, you know, he's back at 205, but he's just not going near Anderson. He pretty much said, my nose is cool the way it is right now. Um... What's going to happen in this fight? Rich Franklin, obviously, he's a well-rounded fighter. He's not one of these, you know, next level, next up cats, you know, like one of these John Jones guys that's, you know, they're coming in with a whole bunch of different, you know. He's pretty much, you know, old school, but still well-rounded. He's good on the ground, good on his feet. You know, he's got good cardio. He knows, you know, how to go out there and get the job done as long as he's not facing guys that are just strictly way better than him. In this fight, he's obviously going to need to go out there, get in, 
get in, jab, jab, cross, leg kick, whatever it is, and get the F out. Because the first time he gets caught will be the last time he gets caught. And I was thinking the whole time, man, this is a pretty easy call to fight. Easy fight to call. It didn't sound right going out. So I had to think about it. It's not a, you know, I was thinking, you know, this is pretty easy. You know, Chuck Liddell is going to go out there and he's going to get tagged up. Not going to get knocked out, but he's just going to get tagged all the way into a Rich Franklin decision. And then I thought about it and I'm thinking, I'm thinking, and I'm like, Rich Franklin's got touched by, you know, everybody he's fought. Guys that he beat and lost, and he shouldn't really get touched by certain guys. Vito Belfort touched him up, knocked him out. Uh, Vanderlei Silva even caught him a few times, and, you know, he was all good, though. We'll lived through that. Dan Henderson touched him up a few times, lived through that. Um, but he pretty much, anybody that wants to strike, anybody who truly wants to strike, can get to Rich Franklin's chin. And Tito, or, uh, sorry, and Chuck Liddell coming out doing his thing. You can't afford to get touched by Chuck. If Chuck touched you, you, you you're you out, most likely. Um, I mean, Vanderlei Silva, you know, that's a weird situation because he got blasted so many times and he never went out. Um, but he gets, you know, hit one or two times by some other people and gets put out, but whatever. Point is not that. The point is Rich Franklin's going to get touched this fight. He's not going to be able to go through this fight unscathed. And I think if he gets touched by Chuck, he's going to get put out. And I don't think it matters when it happens. I don't think it's going to be like a situation where he's got Rashad luck. And I don't want to call it luck, but basically when people almost knock you out and they can't finish you because they're too tired, I don't think that's Chuck's situation is going to happen here. If Chuck touches Rich at any time, Chuck's going to be able to smash him. And I can't believe it, y'all. I cannot believe it. I don't know who else is picking Chuck, but damn, I'm picking Chuck Liddell. I can't believe it. Pat Barry, he'll be taking on Mirko Krokop. Mirko Krokop. Uh, y'all know who he is. There's no really. Why should I talk about what he's done in this history? You know, you know. Damn, I'm gonna do it. You know, K1, one of the top guys, never really won the whole thing, but like fought the best guys and competed at the highest level of heavyweight kickboxing in the world. Brought it over to Moy it over to MMA in like the year 2000, changed the game up. People said, "Man, we got to switch how we're going out there. We're just getting kicked in the face." Switched the game up, went all the way to 2006, won the Openweight Grand Prix, and then splat. After that, wow. After that, you know, came over to uh Came over to the UFC pretty much, you know, beat Eddie Sanchez, lost to Gabriel Gonzaga in Czech Congo, went over to Japan, got a few wins under his belt, and a fight that he was on the way to losing, which was against Alistair Overeem, but, uh, you know, Alistair Overeem's knee smashed him, and uh, and then came back to the UFC, beat Mustafa Al-Turk off basically eye poking some strikes, lost to Junior DeSantos in a very, very bad-looking performance. And then beat Anthony Perros, who was basically the lamb for slaughter, who had lots of heart but not much fight. And everybody always said, is Chuck, is this Mirko Krokop back? Is he back? Is he back? And I say, y'all, is it still where today is the day after yesterday? Do we still move forward in time? Have we started going backwards in time? Because it will not be Crow Cop until we start going back in time. And that hasn't happened yet. And unfortunately, you know, I don't even have to get into Pat Berry's situation um, yet. But unfortunately, the fire is just not always there for some people. Sometimes the fire blazing and then it gets put out. The fire been gone for Mirko Crow Cop before every single fight. I'm, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And then after every single fight recently, it's been like either, well, I beat him, but well, we'll see. Or I lost and I'm, you know, so that's that. Um, on the other hand, he'll be taking on Pat Berry, who the fire could not burn brighter after his win over Anthony Hardong, where he picked up like uh, 120 extra thousand dollars for knockout of the night and fight of the night. He was eating like rice and ketchup. It tastes good, y'all, but you don't want to eat it every day. He was eating that like because he was broke. Um, 
He was coming off a loss to Tim Hag, in which, you know, he should have won that fight, but did some stupid stuff and ended up in the guillotine. Um, but the point is, he's hungry. He's hungry, not because of the rice and the ketchup times. Yo, that was not a fart, y'all. That was my foot. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to try. Damn, I can't even... Wait. See? Is my foot rubbing against the ground, y'all. Don't try and... Come on, y'all. Grow up. Don't be so... <clears throat> Come on, y'all. Don't be so immature. Let's get back to the fights. Um, It wasn't a fart. Uh, Pat Barry is hungry. Simple as that. We've also got another guy from K1. Didn't have half the success that Krokop had. But Pat Barry is fighting a legend. He knows it. He's fighting one of his heroes. He's fighting a guy that he really wants to go out there and, you know, show that I belong out there with him. And simply the fact that Pat Barry is on one side of his career, he's trying to do his thing and he's trying his best to just remain in the UFC and winning and, you know, fighting for a living and seeing how Krokop hasn't looked good in five years. I got to pick Pat Barry. Simple as that. I'm picking Pat Barry. I think it's going to be a situation of, you know, not the most dynamic, exciting fights, but I think Mirko Krokov's going to be doing his thing, throwing the straight, trying to catch Pat Barry with the straight while Pat Barry's throwing kicks. Every now and then, Pat you know, Krokov will throw a high kick, an ill-advised high kick that's not really going to land. If Krokov does somehow come up and show his, you know, old self and do something crazy, yo, I'm going I'm to be cheering, but reality is I don't think that's going down. Paulo Tiago versus Martin Campman. Paulo Tiago is the only guy in the UFC in his situation. Came to the UFC off of let's get Josh Koscheck. It was basically let's get Koscheck a win. That's what it was. Listen, come here. We need to get Josh Koscheck a win. He just lost. I forget who he lost to, but it was a uh, it was an ugly loss. Or maybe he just lost. He needed. He just. It was at the time where Josh Koscheck was fighting every other week, and he was just taking fights, knocking people out. I think he lost the fight, and then he said, I want to get back in there and get a win. I don't know exactly, but the point is, he was fighting way too damn much. They said, just bring this guy over. He's a little jujitsu dude. He'll come on over. And they brought Paul, Paul, uh, Paulo Tiago in. And Paulo Tiago said, uppercut, hook, sit your ass down. And walked over real calm, too. You got to watch. This is the one of the most impressive. This is one of the most impressive, like, Glip, you know, blips, footage you'll ever see. Uh, this guy's in the fight of his life. And the reason he can do this is because he's not really in the fight of his life. This guy's, like I always say, y'all, this guy's badass out there doing all types of craziness in, in Brazil, you know, in shootouts with gangs and the favelas and just grimy. There's nothing like what he goes through in all of America. So get that straight. Um, so he's got real calm nerves. You know, you cannot sneak out behind a corner and scare this dude. You can't throw him a surprise party. Either he will not be surprised or there will be 45 people accidentally shot. All head wounds. Bam, 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 bam. Damn, I just killed my surprise party. But I'm just saying. But you gotta watch what happens with. I'm on a rant here, but you gotta watch what happens when he knocks out Koscheck. He goes uppercut, hook. Now, Koscheck falls down. You got so many people who run over. Oh my god! Oh my god! Where they, they all run over? He just walks over real calm, real calm, and just it's like I'm gonna hit you again unless this referee. Okay. He doesn't even flinch. He goes, bam, bam, knocks him down. Koscheck's falling. So many people sprint. They scream. They jump up and down. They don't know what to do. He goes, pop, pop. And walks kind of with his head up like, this ain't nothing. This is what I was born to do. Walks over and goes, all right, I get the win. Anyways, comes back. They say, yo, put him up against Fitch. You know, he done messed up. Goes to a unanimous decision loss to Fitch. Then he comes out against Jacob Volkman, gets a win over that. Because they're like, we can't just keep giving them tough dudes. Then they give him a fight against Mike Swick. Chokes his ass out unconscious. And now he's fighting Martin Campman. This is a guy that is going to basically win his way to a title shot and always get picked against. Crazy. He's going to be... By the way, he's got uh, eight submissions. 
uh, two knockouts, 13 wins. His only loss is to number two uh, welterweight in the world, John Fitch. He's going to be fighting Martin Campman. Martin Campman is coming off a win over Jacob Voltman. You see how there's a lot of names that just get recycled and used over. Before that, he got knocked out against Paul Daly where he decided, I want to stand with Paul Daly. I don't want to take it to the ground. You know, you should have talked to Jackson or somebody. Um, he had a split decision win over Carlos Condit. He has a, a little bit back, 2008, a loss to Nate Marquardt. But basically, you know, he's a well-rounded fighter. He's got um, seven knockouts, six submissions out of his 16 wins. He's going to want to try and keep this fight standing. Um, Paulo Thiago will be willing and ready to do this fight wherever, you know, if it's on the feet, he'll fight on the feet. If it's on the ground, he'll fight on the ground. He would prefer to take it to the ground. I am going to pick Paulo Thiago just off of, you know, knowing that this guy is going to come out there with a game plan, ice running through his veins, and, uh, and also... Campman's inability to truly put together um, the kind of game plan that, that that will continuously get him wins. So I'm going to pick Paulo Tiago. Ben Rothwell versus Gilbert I. Bell. Ben Rothwell hasn't fought since uh, October 2009. Coming off of his... Uh, he just got destroyed against Cain Velasquez. He has a win over Chris Gian and then a, a loss to Andre Olovsky at Affliction. Um, before that, he was killing it for for a couple years. 17 knockouts, 11 submissions, 30 wins, 7 losses. You know, his problem is wrestling, but he's got powerful hands. He knows how to get the job done. Um, not a top 10 fighter, but not everybody can be. He'll be facing Gilbert Ivel. Gilbert Ivel... You know, the UFC will want you to believe that this guy was, you know, pride's, you know, you know, pride's pride and joy. But, you know, dude was one in seven and one in pride. He did not have a good pride career. Um. Anyways, since coming to the UFC, he has a knockout loss to Junior DeSantos. Um, he does have a recent win, a somewhat recent win. Over uh, Pedro Hizzo, and he lost at Affliction to uh, Josh Barnett. Um, in this fight, it's going to be a striking fight. I, I believe it's going to be a battle of strikes. Gilbert Ivel does like to, you know, hold his hands a little too low, but he is a serious striker. I think he's going to use kicks and an aggression to win this fight. Um, I'm going to say a second round TKO. I mean, Ben Rothwell, if he could, you know, just decide to go out and take this fight to the ground, he would have a much easier <clears throat> situation in front of him. I don't know if he's going to do that. If he does do that, then, you know, I would give this fight to Ben Rothwell. But uh, I'm going to go out there because of the fact that there's this cage that, you know, that uh, Gilbert Ivel can maybe use to, to keep it on his feet. And I'm going to pick... Uh, I'm gonna pick Ben. I'm gonna pick uh, Gilbert Ivel. Carlos Condit versus Rory McDonald. Carlos Condit, Jake Ellenberger was his last fight. Uh, he's had a win. He had a loss to Martin Campman. Um, Twenty-four wins, five losses, ten knockouts, thirteen submissions. Fights with Jackson submission fighting. Um, good fighter, you know. It's just when he does face top guys, he loses. Jake Shields lost to him. Uh, I'm not saying Katalka is a top guy, but lost to Katalka. And, uh, I mean, he beat John Alessio and Brock Larson, both in the WEC. Uh, but basically, you know, he's a good fighter. What do you want me to say? He's a good fighter, but he's not one of the top guys. That's pretty much the way this whole card goes. Good fighter. Not a top guy other than Paulo Tiago. Uh, he'll be fighting Rory McDonald, who is on a 10-fight uh, winning streak, unbeaten. His last win was a submission over Matt Guyman. Um, this could be a good fight. This could definitely be a good fight. Out of uh, out of all of his wins, uh, Rory McDonald has finished everybody. 
four knockouts, six submissions. Um, it'll be his biggest test for sure in Carlos Condit. I'm going to have to go with Carlos Condit just by having faced better competition, been fighting longer, and just being overall. I believe he's probably overall the better fighter. Uh, but, you know, Roy McDonald is undefeated, and this is his biggest test, so anything could happen. On the preliminary card, we got Tyson Griffin versus Evan Dunham. Evan Dunham's the other guy I was looking at. I was looking at in lightweight, a uh, dude who just beat Diego Sanchez, uh, Hathaway. I was looking at him like, you know, this guy is serious. And uh, also, I was looking at Evan Dunham. Uh, Evan Dunham versus Tyson Griffin. I'm not going to get into it. I'm picking Evan Dunham. Um, Mac Danzig versus Matt Wyman. I'm picking Matt Wyman. By the way, is Mac Danzig the most loudest talker of all time? Every time you see these pros picks, it, it, for sure, dog, he is bashing somebody. Every He just, they say, what do you think about this fight? And he basically goes, well, this guy's an asshole, or I hate this guy, or this guy has no morals, or this guy's got no heart. He just bashes people, and then he picks us. Anyways, I'm picking Matt Wyman. On the preliminary card, we might not see these. I'm picking Mario Miranda over David Loazzo. Damn, RIP, you know, all that stuff. Canada, what, 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 throwing up gang signs. But um, I'm going to have to pick the Brazilian. I'm picking uh, James Wilkes over Peter Sabata. I'm picking Claude Patrick with the submission of the night over Ricardo Funch. Guillotine submission of the night is going down. Give him his $60,000 right now. That's my boy, Claude. What up, man? Why don't you call me? Stop acting up. I know you're in the UFC now. Come on, dog. And then I'm picking Mike Powell over Jesse Lennox. UFC 115. It's not the greatest, but it's MMA. It's on. Get it. Watch it. Enjoy it. Check that out. back, y'all. He's back. He's back. He's back. MMA, it's important, y'all. Peace.